In the case of scholars, or in the case of really scientific men, it may be, there may really be such a thing as an impulse to knowledge, some kind of small independent clockwork which, when well wound up, works away industriously to that end. Without the rest of the scholarly impulses taking a material part therein, the actual interests of the scholar, therefore, are generally in quite another direction. It is the family, or in money making, or in politics. It is, in fact, almost indifferent at what point of research his little machine is placed, and whether the hopeful young worker becomes a good philologist, someone who studies the words, a mushroom specialist, or a chemist, is not characterized by this. It's not characterized by the this or that. Nietzsche's point there, fundamentally, is that if you do analyze the in whom the, the will to knowledge might actually be offered him, even though he wouldn't be willing to grant it the status of highest motivating power, that even in those people where that will to knowledge does exist, the probability that that is in turn subordinated to some other principle that's higher than the value of our is very, very high. And it's hard to tell exactly. itself as the ultimate end of existence and the legitimate lord over all of the other impulses. That's an, another, like, the beyond good and evil, to think of it as a book is a very foolish framework. You know, because this is what a book is when people think about a book. It's like a material entity. It's, it's eight inches high six inches wide and two inches thick and weighs a pound and it's made of paper that's between two, two covers. You know, and that's a materialist. That's the a priori sort of axiomatic view of the book. Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil isn't a book at all. It's a series of bombs. And each sentence is a bomb. And each sentence blows things up that people don't even know exist. And so one of the things that this sentence, for example, Here's how he's conceptualizing the human being. So the first thing he talks about is that the there are fundamental impulses in human beings. Okay, so that, that begs the question is, well, what do you mean by impulse? And what do you mean by fundamental And both of those are extraordinarily complicated problems. So an impulse, you can think of an impulse as a drive. You can think about it as a biological instinct. <clears throat> you can think about it as an aim. As an act of will. Like there's, there's endless questions that, that hang off that question, but we can start with the idea that we perhaps can't define it, but we are willing to go with the proposition that people do have impulses. And I think maybe that's manifest to you more, most particularly <clears throat> when you're attempting to do something voluntarily and something involuntarily interferes with that. You know, so maybe you're sitting down to Sexual fantasy, 
or you or or there's some other thing that you could do that's useful but that you wouldn't normally do that you'll go do instead or that you fall asleep or that you get hungry or like there's an endless number of that's called them impulses that might arise to interfere with your conscious movement forward well exactly what are those things well Nietzsche certainly conceptualizes the human being as a place where those things live and he does mean live too because it wouldn't refer to them as de demons or, or genies without introducing the metaphor conception of something that lives and so hardly what Nietzsche reveals in those sentences is that he conceptualizes human beings as the, the dwelling place of spirits and some of them are genie let's say that's the word genius that's the terribly powerful thing that exists in the terribly small compartment that you have to call forth and some of them are demons and demons are things that have their own autonomous will and that generally are aiming for the good so then so those are all things Nietzsche just lays out as implicit parts of the sentence. So he activates all those ideas, whether you know it or not, in your mind to the degree that you process the sentence. And those things start to take on life of their own, of their own those ideas. So then he, he adds another dimension of complexity to that by saying, well, you're full of demons and, 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 and genes. And they're all doing their own thing, whatever that happens to be. But each of them, if left to their own devices, would attempt to remake the entire world in their form. And so I, I, I thought of this from, from a narrative point of view, from a symbolic point of view. In, 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 in old stories, in folk tales and fairy tales, you often have a, a cyclops, the one-eyed giants. There's a sexual connotation to that, which is, which is apropos that the psychoanalysts would certainly point out. But the one eye idea is that this thing is gigantic and wants one thing. And so that's another way that Nietzsche is conceptualizing the fundamental structure of the human psyche. It's a dwelling place for one eyed giants, and they're constantly. One of them wants to be the largest one eyed giant and dominate everything else. And then one of the things that, so Nietzsche takes that argument further and he says, not only is this always happening in human beings, but that if you look at philosophy, what it is, is it's a continual revelation of the attempt of some singular minded psychic monster, psychological monster, to dominate the entire psychological structure and therefore the entire cultural structure and therefore the entire world and then you can you can see in that the entire religious structure struggle of mankind to take this vast polytheistic vision of reality and to organize it into some sort of monotheistic and integrated structure which you could also consider indistinguishable from the civilizing the impulse that operates in human beings to become civilized. Because on the one hand, it might be a terrible thing that one one-eyed monster emerges to attempt to dominate all the others. But then on the other hand, there's no difference between that and organizing something. Because to organize something is to bring it all into a hierarchical structure with some sort of singular value at the forefront. And then the question might be, well, what should that singular value be? And then Nietzsche would that ties the whole argument back into the first sentences that he wrote at the beginning of the paragraph, which is, well, what is it that the philosopher is up to? What is the force that he's serving? What is the unifying impulse? That's another way of looking at it. If there's a unifying impulse, and he's not only fallen prey to some internal demon, if there's a unifying impulse to bring all of this together into some sort of functional structure, what exactly might that look like? For every impulse is imperious and as such attempts to philosophize. That's part of that sort of Nietzsche's idea of will to power in in its nascent form. Like all of these unconscious entities that 
inhabit the human psyche are all alive and they're trying to live they're trying to they're trying to climb up the dominance hierarchy and dominate because of course that's partly what life does because let's say from an evolutionary perspective and this is probably more true for males because they're less effective in their attempts to replicate the distinction between climbing up a dominance hierarchy, whatever that might happen to be, and success is, there may be no distinction at all. And then you might say, well, that just shows that there's nothing but will to power. But <laughs> that still doesn't answer one of the most fundamental questions, is that power in relationship to what? Because that's the question.